طيب أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته جزاك الله خير tonight we're going to begin going through the strengthening the foundations we're going to begin this journey inshallah and we're going to begin with a book it's called the new muslim guide by fahid salam the hammam and alhamdulillah we're calling it strengthening the foundations because the muslim is always in need of renewing his intentions. Actions are based by their intentions and the Muslim is always in need of renewing and refreshing his intentions and his relationships with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are beginning on page 24. It says the greatest blessing ever. It says here, Allah has bestowed countless blessings upon us. He has endowed us with the gifts of sight and hearing and intellect, health, wealth and family. He has even subjected everything in the universe for in the universe for us, the sun, the moon, the heavens and the earth, and many countless things as the Quran states. If you try to number Allah's blessings, you could never count them. Surah Al Maidah sixteen eighteen. However, all these blessings will cease to exist when our short worldly life comes to an end. The only blessing that is bound to bring about happiness and tranquility in this life and eternal bliss in the hereafter is the blessing of being a Muslim, which is undeniably the greatest blessing Allah has ever bestowed upon us. It is for this reason that Allah attributes this blessing to him, giving a great honor over other blessings as the Quran states, Today I have perfected your religion for you, completing my, completed my blessing upon you, and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. Surah Al-Ma'idah 5, 3 How great Allah's blessings upon us are He has taken us out of darkness Of ignorance into the light of faith And guided us to the true religion Which he has chosen for us In order to realize the objective behind our existence Namely, to worship him And thus lead a happy life in this world And obtain an excellent reward in the hereafter How great Allah's favors are upon us are he has chosen us, made us the best community that has ever been brought forth for the good of mankind, bearing the testimony of faith. La ilaha illallah. There is no God worthy of worship except Allah, with which he has sent all of his prophets. When some ignorant people mistakenly thought that they had done the Prophet wasallam, a favor by embracing Islam, Allah reminded them that it was indeed Allah who had favored them by guiding them to Islam in the first place, as the Quran states. They think they have done you a favor by becoming Muslim. Say, O Muhammad, do not consider your Islam a favor to me. No, indeed, it is Allah who has favored you by guiding you to the faith if you are telling the truth. Surah Al Hujurat 49 17. It is true that Allah's blessings are numerous, but the only blessing. As the verse makes it clear regarding which Allah de declares he has bestowed a favor upon us is that of guiding us to Islam and to worshiping him alone without associating any partners with him whatsoever. Therefore, indeed, therefore, in order to continue benefiting from such immense blessing, we need to express gratefulness to Allah for bestowing such a favor upon us. As the Quran states, if you are grateful, I will surely I will certainly give you increase. Surah Al-Ibrahim 14.7 How can we then possibly show gratefulness to Allah for such a blessing? As he says, one we can't even count. This can be done by doing the following of two things. One, to adhere to Islam and patiently endure all the hardships that come our way. And two, to introduce and invite others to it with wisdom and patience. We continue the purpose of human existence. Many philosophers and lay people alike finding awful, find it awfully puzzling to answer the most important question in our life. Why are we here? What is the real purpose of human existence? The Quran has clearly and accurately stated the purpose of human existence thus, 
I have only created the jinn and man to worship me. Allah says in Surah ad daryat 5156, It is clear, therefore, that we are here to worship Allah, the Almighty. It is worth noting here, however, the, that worship or ibadah in Islam does not imply abandonment of the life of the world and its pleasures. It is a comprehensive term, which includes, in addition to such acts of worship as prayer, fasting, and the obligatory charity zakat, all human acts, as long as they are done for the sake of Allah, as the Prophet ﷺ once observed, you will be rewarded even when you engage in sexual intercourse with your wives. In this way, worship, despite being the main purpose behind human existence, becomes the essence of life, affording a Muslim the opportunity to turn all daily lawful practices into great acts of worship. The Quran states, Say, my prayer and my sacrifice, my living and my dying are, are all for Allah alone, the Lord of the worlds. And here we have the statement that was quoted for the, from the Prophet وسلم, in regards to being rewarded for engaging in sexual intercourse with one's wives. This is part of a hadith where the Prophet وسلم, the companions are coming to him. It says here, some, of the, some people from amongst the companions of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said to the Prophet وسلم, O Messenger of Allah, the affluent, meaning the rich, they have made off with the rewards. They pray as we pray, they fast as we fast, and they give much in charity by virtue of their wealth, their surplus wealth. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to their complaint, has Allah, made, has Allah not made things for you to give in charity? Truly every tasbih saying SubhanAllah is a charity, and every takbir saying Allahu Akbar is a charity, and every tahmeed saying Alhamdulillah is a charity. And every tahleel saying La ilaha illallah is a charity. And commanding the good is a charity. And forbidding an evil is also a charity. And in the sexual act of each one of you, there is a charity. The companions, right, as you and I might say, what, is, what does this mean? Now sexual intercourse, how could this possibly be a charity? No? The Prophet, they said that, O Messenger of Allah, when one of us fulfills a sexual desire, will we, will we have some reward for that? He وسلم, said, do you not see? And the wisdom behind this is, is clear, is the point of all of this. Do you not see that if you were to act upon it, meaning your sexual desire in an unlawful manner, then he would be deserving of a punishment? Likewise, if you were to act upon it in a lawful manner, then he will be deserving of reward. So this goes back to what the Sheikh was saying here. In this way, worship, despite being the main purpose behind human existence, becomes the essence of, of life, affording the Muslim an opportunity to, to turn all daily lawful practices into great acts of worship. So this is actually Islam. This is actually Islam. This hadith here, this narration from our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, explains the premise behind Islam. Doing lawful practices and expecting the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty. It says here, Islam is a universal religion. Islam is a universal religion in that, the, in that its prophet was sent to all people of the world, regardless of their race, color, culture, traditions, and geographical location. As the Quran states, we have only sent you, O Muhammad. As a mercy to all the world, Surah Al Anbiya 21107. This is why Islam respects all the various human traditions and does not require new Muslims to change their own traditions unless they contravene some of the Islamic teachings. Thus, any tradition that goes against Islamic teachings must be changed and replaced with a better alternative. For if for for it is after all. Allah, the all-knowing, the all-aware, who commands and forbids whatever He wills. And our faith in Him requires us to act in accordance with His laws. Islam also teaches that Muslims, that Muslims' traditions that are not related to Islam and its teachings must be considered, must not be considered Islamic, and that a new Muslim does not have to honor or observe them, for they merely constitute 
a set of permissible customs or a certain group of people. It says here the entire earth is a place for worship. Islam considers any place in the world to be appropriate for worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that there is no particular place or country that Muslims must migrate to and settle in. For the criterion here is the possibility to worship Allah in peace. Nor does it oblige them to emigrate to another country unless they are prevented from worshiping Allah in the country they live, in which case they may go to another country where they can worship Allah in total peace, as the Quran states, my servants. Allah says, my servants, you who have believed, my earth is wide, so worship me alone. Surah al ankabut 2956. We continue, it says, no intermediaries between God and man. Many religions have given certain religious privileges to some individuals and made people's worship and faith dependent upon such individuals' approval. In other words, they constitute intermediaries between God and them and falsely claim they can pardon their sins and even have knowledge of the unseen. Thus, Islam came to honor and dignify man and refute the false idea that man's worship, repentance, or salvation is dependent upon certain individuals' sanction, no matter how devout and virtuous they may be. In Islam, a Muslim worships Allah directly, without any intermediaries whatsoever between him and his Lord. For Allah is close to his servants. He can hear their prayer and respond to them and see their worship and reward, and reward them for performing it. No one in Islam claims, no one in Islam claims, no one in Islam claims to forgive sins and all for indulgences. If a person commits a sin and seeks and sincerely seeks Allah's forgiveness, Allah certainly pardons his sins. No one possesses supernatural powers or can influence the universe in any way for the power of decision rests solely with Allah alone. Allah alone. Islam has also liberated the human mind and encourages Muslims when differences arise to refer to the Quran and the authentic sayings and actions, the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, for no human being has the prerogative to decide on religious matters after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except Allah's Messenger wasallam. The recipient of Allah's revelation who does not speak out of his own desire as the Quran states he does not speak from his own desire it is nothing but revelation revealed. Surah Najm 53, 3-4 How great this religion is. It is in utter harmony with the pure natural disposition upon which Allah originated man, making him his own master and enabling him to exchange the servitude to false gods for the perfect freedom of worshipping Allah alone. Now I'm going to continue. Islam is a religion of life. Islam is a religion which balances the worldly life and the life to come. According to Islam, the worldly life is like a farm in which a Muslim sows the seeds of good deeds in all aspects of life. We've spoken about how everything is a good deed, right? Anything lawful, that is. Anything done lawfully is a good deed. And so which a Muslim sows the seeds of good deeds in all aspects of life in order to reap the rewards of his hard work, both in this life and most importantly in the hereafter. The endeavor requires an optimistic attitude, dedication, seriousness, and determination, which is obvious in the following points. 1. Developing the earth. The Quran states, He brought you into being from the earth and made you its inhabitants. Surah Hud 11.61 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and placed us on this earth, commanding us to develop it, establish a civilization to benefit humanity in a way that does not contradict Islamic teachings. That does not contradict Islamic teachings. Indeed, he considers doing so an act of worship for which its doer will be rewarded. So again, now being rewarded for what? Establishing a civilization. Now, even if it is done in times of great turmoil and under terrifying circumstances, such as a day of resurrection, the Prophet wasallam once said, if the day of judgment takes place and you recognize that it's taking place while a man is holding a palm tree seedling to plant his soil, let him plant it if he, if he can, let him plant it. Muslim Imam Ahmed 27, 12. 
Maintaining social relations. Islam calls its adherents to cooperate with people around them, regardless of their culture and religion, in order to establish a civilization and build a healthy society. It urges them it urges them to associate with them and build relationships of the highest order, governed by the sublime moral standards Islam teaches. It also warns them against isolation and withdrawal from society, considering such a course to go against the right method naturally adopted by those dedicated to preaching Islam and calling to its sublime principles. Indeed, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, once observed that a believer who mixes with people and endures their harm is far better than one who does not associate them, who does not associate with them altogether. Hmm. Patience. Now nah, we're talking about having patience. We're talking about having patience. This is this is what it's about. Knowledge acquisition. It was not a, it was not a coincidence that the first word revealed to the Prophet وسلم, was read Iqra. In fact, Islam stresses stresses the importance of acquiring beneficial knowledge in all fields of human interest and considers the path that a Muslim follows to seek knowledge a path that actually leads to paradise. As the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, said, Whoever treads a path to seek knowledge, Allah will ease the way to paradise for him. Sahih Ibn, Ibn Hibban 84 In fact, Islam has never witnessed a conflict between religion and science, as is the case with other religions. On the contrary, it has always supported it and called its adherents to acquire it and teach it to others as long it is, as it is bound as long as it is bound to benefit mankind. Islam even honors those who teach people and impart knowledge to them. Holding them in high esteem and promising them abundant rewards, the Prophet وسلم, informs us in one of his traditions that all Allah's creations praise all that all Allah's creation praise for those who impart beneficial knowledge to people. So the entire creation. The entire creation, the fish in the sea the birds in the sky, when the person is seeking beneficial knowledge and teaching it to the people, those creation are benefiting them, are, 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 are asking Allah to forgive them. Learning Islamic rulings. A Muslim is required to learn about the Islamic rulings in all aspects of life, acts of worship, social relations, among other things, in order, in order to carry out his duties with accurate knowledge and immense certainty. As the Prophet وسلم, said, whoever Allah wishes to show goodness, whoever Allah wishes to show goodness, he gives him understanding of the religion. This is found in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Therefore, he must learn all about the religious duties that he is required to undertake, such as purification, wudu, the manner of performing the prayer, the lawful and unlawful foods and drinks in Islam. And he is also urged to learn about acts that are recommended but not obligatory. Recommended but not obligatory. So we have here, what are the five types of Islamic rulings? All human actions fall into five categories. One, the obligatory. Obligatory acts denote those acts which Allah commands Muslims to do. Command Muslims to do. Those who do them will be rewarded, but those who neglect them will be subject to to punishment. Examples of such acts include the five obligatory daily prayers and fasting during the month of Ramadan, which is coming up soon, inshallah. Another one is included is the haram, the prohibited actions. This denotes those acts which Allah has prohibited. Those who leave them will be rewarded, but those who engage in them will be punished. Examples of such acts include drinking alcohol and committing illicit sexual intercourse. Recommended actions. This is used to describe acts which are recommended but are not punishable for their omission, such as smiling at people, initiating the greeting of, of Islam, Assalamu alaikum, initiating that, when meeting them and removing dirt or harmful objects from the road. So these are recommended acts. Um, we have dislike acts, makro, dislike acts. This denotes those acts which Islam urges its adherents to avoid. Those who avoid them, those who avoid them will be rewarded, and those who do them will not be subject to punishment. They include such acts as fiddling with one's fingers during the prayer. Permissible acts. 
This denotes those acts which are neither forbidden nor recommended. They are rather neutral and thus subject and thus subject neither to reward nor to punishment. They include eating, drinking, and talking. Now, permissible acts, right? And we're talking about eating, drinking, and talking. Eating, if you we were talking about earlier being rewarded for such acts that, that are done right with an intention, with a good intention. If you're eating to gain strength, for example, somebody who's gonna pray who's gonna pray, who's gonna fast rather. You're gonna fast uh, on Thursday, right? You're gonna fast on Thursday and you're gonna eat in the morning. You're just eating. Right? It's just eating. <clears throat> but you're eating why? What's your intention behind eating? You wanna be able to fast in the best way possible. So I'm gonna eat, I'm gonna have a good meal, a wholesome meal. Now this is not just regular eating. This eating becomes worship, worship. So we continue, it says the five pillars of Islam. The Prophet وسلم, said, Islam has been built on five pillars, testifying that there is no God but, but Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, performing the prayers, paying zakat, Making the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and fasting in Ramadan. These five pillars constitute the very foundation of Islam, and we will examine them and discuss their rulings in the following chapters. The first of these is faith and the, the affirmation of Allah's unity, or Tawheed, Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. This is discussed in the next chapter titled Your Faith. After this comes the prayer, Salat which is the greatest and most exalted of all acts of worship. The Prophet وسلم, once described it as the pillar of the religion. Sunan Tirmidhi. This means that it is the pillar upon which Islam is firmly established. A pillar is a post that is used to support a building without which the building will collapse. Without which the building will collapse. This is a pillar. However, for the prayer to be valid, a Muslim must offer it after purifying himself. Hence, the chapter, your faith, is logically followed by your purification and then your prayer. So in the next page, we have the pictures of, you know, a couple things here and just some reminders. It says here, how to find out about the rulings of Islam. If a person contracts an illness and wants to get a medical treatment, he would definitely look for the most proficient doctors he could possibly find to obtain the most effective treatment possible for his illness. He will certainly not take a prescription from any doctor because from, from, from any doctor, meaning any Tom and Harry, right? <laughs> SubhanAllah. Because his life is dear to him. Religion is undoubtedly the most important thing in our life. And we must therefore do our best to find out about its rulings and teachings and seek answers to questions about matters we do not know from trustworthy, knowledgeable scholars. Reading the present book which teaches you matters relating to your religion in their true light is a step in the right direction. Searching for the right information requires you to ask scholars' opinions. The present book, the present book serves you well because it contains scholar statements and answers to your queries. As the Quran states, if you do not know, then ask the people of expert knowledge, Surah Nahal 1643. You must also take further steps. If you are in doubt as to any Islamic rulings on any given issue, you can do this by contacting Islamic centers and mosques near you, ensuring that they are from amongst those adhering to the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. You can find out about their locations and contact details by visiting this following website. This is here, Islamic Finder, but inshallah, you have one very near you, with the left. It says here, Islam is a moderate religion. Islam is a moderate religion which follows a middle course between exaggeration and negligence, extremism, and a total rejection of religion. This moderation pervades all acts of worships and ritual. It is for this reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet وسلم, his companions and the believers at large to observe moderation, which can be realized by doing two things. One, adhering to religion and honoring Allah's sacred rights. And two, avoiding exaggeration and extremism. The Quran states, keep to the right course as, you've been, as you have been commanded 
and also those who turn with you to Allah and do not exceed the bounds. He sees what you do. Surah Hud 11, 112. This means be steadfast in following the truth to the best of your ability without overstepping the limits through exaggeration and extremism. Once, while teaching his companions one of the rites of pilgrimage, the Prophet وسلم, warned them against going to extremes, pointing out that doing so was the reason behind the destruction of past nations. He وسلم, said, Beware of extremism in religion, for the only thing that destroyed those before you was extremism in religion. This, that is why he also noted, Take upon yourself only those actions for which you have the strength to carry out consistently. On another occasion, he revealed the spirit of the message with which he was sent, namely, not to burden people beyond their capacity, but to teach them with wisdom and make things easy for them. Allah did not send me to be harsh or cause harm, but he sent me to teach people and make things easy for them. This fine is Sahih Muslim. It says here, Islam covers all aspects of life. Islam is not only a spiritual need fulfilled by Mus Islam is not only a spiritual need fulfilled by Muslims in mosques through prayers and applications, nor it is a mere nor is it a mere set of views and belief espoused by its by its adherents, nor is it merely a comprehensive economic system, nor is it simply a set of rules and principles for building a society and a system, nor is it only a set of morals and manners for dealing with others is not only all of these things rather it is a comprehensive way of life which covers all aspects of life without exception indeed almighty allah has completed his favor upon the muslims by choosing islam for them as their religion and a complete way of life as the quran states this day i have perfected your religion for you completed my favor upon you and chosen for you islam as your religion surah maida 5:3 once, when one of the polytheists sarcastically said to Salman al-Farisi one of the Prophet's companions, it was said to him, your Prophet has taught you everything, even the manner of defecating. Salman proudly said, yes. Yes, indeed. And then he went about to show him the etiquette of using the toilet. And this is a fact. We know exactly how to walk into the bathroom, what do we say when we walk into the bathroom. We know what to say when we walk out of the bathroom. We know even what hand to use when we're using the bathroom and what hand not to use. And it's, just, it's a different hand than the hand that you use to eat. So the Muslim, he's never going to shake his hand with you with the hand that he uses in the bathroom. And all of this is found in Islam. All of this is found in Islam. So you can see why Salman was so proud. It was a point of it was a point of, of, of pride for him that he was a Muslim. Not that he was proud, but he was happy. He was happy and he was proud that yes, I have been taught these things, whereas you may not have been. Islam must be judged by its sublime principles and not by the bad conduct of some Muslims. It says here, if you find a doctor who adopts harmful medical procedures or a teacher with some or a teacher with some bad moral character, you will certainly disapprove of their wrong practices which are obviously at odds with their social position and the type of knowledge they have acquired. This, however, will not make you change your mind about the great benefits medical science has afforded mankind or the great position education and learning occupies in society and civilization. You would undoubtedly reach the conclusion that such a doctor or teacher actually misrepresents his, prof his professional qualifications and affiliations. By the same token, if you find some Muslims who follow some bad practices, you may mistakenly assume that such practices reflect the spirit of Islam, which is obviously not true, as it was in the previous example. Just because the wrong practices of a doctor or a teacher cannot be possibly attributed to the medical or educational profession, such Muslims' bad practices cannot, with even a stronger reason, be attributed to Islam. They merely constitute an aspect of human weakness and could therefore be attributed to wrong cultural practices which have nothing to do with Islam. So this speaks to the weakness of the human being and how we should overlook, how we should be, 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 be of those people who overlook the weaknesses of others as we recognize our own weaknesses. 
It says here the five necessities. The five necessities are the ultimate benefits with which, with which man must enjoy in order to lead an honorable life. Indeed, all divine laws have commanded their preservation and prohibited anything that contradicts them. Islam urges its adherents to protect such necessities so that they may serve them well in the worldly life and the life to come and thus live in total peace and security. Muslims in all parts of the world form one single community, an ummah, whose members support one another as if they were a solid cemented structure, each part strengthening and support and giving support to the others. They are as the Prophet وسلم, once described them like one body. When any part of it aches, the whole body aches because of sleepness and fever. Sleepless, sleeplessness and fever. Abu Hamza Anas ibn Malik reported that the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, said, None of you truly believes until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. And this hadith is found in Bukhari and Muslim. And this is one key takeaway. This is one key takeaway from today's class. This is how we Muslims should interact with one another. We should interact with one another as the nervous system interacts with the circulatory system, right? As the skeletal system interacts with the nervous system, right? As the kidneys and the liver interact with the heart, as the glands and this and that, this is how the Muslims should feel about one another. And they should react like this to one another. And the reason why is because the Prophet Wasallam said, what? None of you truly believes until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. Wouldn't you want your brother to be happy? Wouldn't you want yourself to be happy? So make your brother happy. Wouldn't you want somebody to greet you? So greet your brother. Wouldn't you want your brother to help you out, to give you a good word, to encourage you? Encourage your brother. These five necessities can be preserved by one, recognizing and appreciating them, two, protecting them against any violations. So the first of the five is religion. This is the main reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created people and sent messengers to convey it to them and to preserve it as the Quran states, we sent the messenger among people saying, worship Allah and keep clear of all false gods. Surah Nahal 1636. Indeed, Islam insists on preserving religion and protecting it against anything which is bound to mar its purity, such as worshiping, worshiping false gods besides Allah or instead of him, shirk, and engaging in superstitions and for committing forbidden acts like going to magicians, uh, trusting in horoscopes, and the likes. Number two, life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to preserve human life even if, it, even if this involves the commission of a sin, especially if one is driven by necessity to do so. As the Quran states, but whoever is forced by necessity, neither desiring it, nor transgressing its limit, there is no sin upon him. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Surah Al-Baqarah 2, 173. He has forbidden suicide or any act against human life in general. Allah says, do not cast yourselves into destruction. Surah Al-Baqarah 2, 195. He has also legislated punishments which serve, which serve to derp. He has also legislated punishments which serve to deter people from unjustly harming others, no matter what their religion may be. Allah says, O oh, you who believe, fair retribution is prescribed for you in cases of murder. And Allah says in the Quran, in another verse, Surah Maida 5 8, O oh, you who believe, be persistently standing firm for Allah, witnesses in justice, and do not let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just. Be just. So Allah says, again, don't let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just. Be just. That is nearer to righteousness. And fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is acquainted with all that you do. So the third of the five is the mind. Islam prohibits anything that is bound to have a negative effect on the mind and impair discernment. Indeed, the intellect is one of the greatest blessings Allah has bestowed upon us. And it is the very faculty by which Allah has honored man and favored him above other creatures. 
It is also the reason that makes him subject to accountability in this life and in the hereafter. In one of the verses in the Quran, Surah Al-Araf, verse 179, Allah says, and we have certainly created hell. We, and we have certainly created for hell many of the jinn and, and mankind. They have hearts with which they do not understand. They have eyes with which they do not see. And they have ears with which they do not hear. Those are like livestock. Rather, they are more astray. It is they who are heedless. And in this verse, is similar to what the author is, is saying here. The human being on account of not using his faculties the way he's supposed to, on account of not using his faculties the way he is supposed to, will be held accountable for them. In fact, creatures that do not have these faculties and do not have these responsibilities are better than those who do have them and don't use them. This is why Allah says they are like livestock. Rather, Allah says, rather, they are more astray. It is they who are the heedless. Hmm? It is for this reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden all types of intoxicants. All things that render these faculties null and void. You can't see right, you can't think right, you can't, you can't hear right. You have no intellect, right? When you use these types of intoxicants, which Allah describes as an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Allah says, O you who believe intoxicants, gambling, stone altars, and divining arrows are abominations devised by Satan. Avoid them so you may be successful. Surah Al Maida 590. Number four, we have the progeny. Islam stresses. Islam stresses the importance. Of preserving progeny and starting a family in which the new generation acquire good manners and learn lofty principles. This is clear in a number of rulings which include the following. 1. It encourages marriage and prompts its adherence to make it easy for unmarried people with the least expenses, meaning, or Allah says, marry off those among you who are unmarried. Surah Nur 2432. It prohibits all uh, it, <clears throat> it prohibits all sinful illicit relationships and has blocked all the ways leading to them Allah says do not go near do not go near fornication it is an indecent act and an evil way Surah Al-Isra 1732 it forbids slandering or defaming people's lineage and considers this act a major sin for which, for which the perpetrator is subject to a specified punishment in this life, in addition to severe chastisement in the hereafter. It commands its adherence to preserve people's honor, and considers a person who is killed defending his honor or that of his family a martyr. And the fifth, we have property. Islam urges his followers to protect their property and preserve their wealth, and commands them to earn a living, making all commercial transactions that are lawful lawful in order to protect wealth it considers usury interest deception and misappropriation of people's wealth by using wrongful means strictly forbidden the quran warns perpetrators of such acts of severe punishment so alhamdulillah this is the introduction we've completed the introduction and inshallah the importance of manners in Islam and how Islam is meant to not just rectify your character but to make you identify yourself as part of a community that is supposed to also be doing the same thing you know so many people would say well the streets are dirty well then just make sure you're not contributing to that filth make sure you're not also dropping even the smallest rapper because if everybody drops a tootsie roll on the floor you know what can we expect you know, so the Muslim is somebody who's always seeking to better his relationship with Allah because he understands that Allah is always watching him. And so this is going to encourage him to strive with the best of manners. With the best of manners while Allah is always watching him. The Muslim also understands that there will be a day 
there will be a day which he in which he will be judged and just as a just as a Muslim or as a regular person works and seeks payment on Friday or on Thursday right the Muslim understands that he is going to receive and she is going to receive payment on that day so this person sets forth things sets forth actions we're talking about actions of charity right what are charities making sure that on your tongue at least you're saying la ilaha illallah saying subhanallah something happens to you subhanallah something something good comes across or somebody says something good about you or you see something good on somebody mashallah right something is surprising to you la ilaha illallah right you say these words alhamdulillah you're very happy about something or something difficult happens to you and you have to be patient upon that and you think about all of Allah's other blessings upon you alhamdulillah right so the muslim is always being mindful of his character and not just that these words don't just bring you comfort today right they don't just bring you comfort today but you understand through the narrations that we've presented here today and through these chapters right that the muslim expects a reward expects a reward from Allah and he's hopeful for that reward. He's what? He's optimistic. She's optimistic. And they work with optimism, with seriousness, with determination for that reward. And just like at work, you seek to be around people who are also productive. The Muslim is always is also seeking people in his or her life that are going to help them be productive. What? Towards that end. Towards that end. So alhamdulillah. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, we're here. Jazakallah khair. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And in the next class, we will begin on the chapter of faith. The chapter of faith speaks on the six pillars of Iman, the six pillars of faith. It will speak on what does La ilaha illallah mean and what does Muhammad Rasulullah mean. What, is it, what does it mean? What does it imply when you say La ilaha illallah? Is that just something we say off our tongues? Is that something we believe? Is that something that you act upon? Right? Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam What does this mean? Right? What are the five pillars of Iman? Right? The six pillars of Iman So this is what we'll go over Inshallah, if Allah gives us long life in our next class. Let's see. So the name of the book is called The New Muslim Guide. It's called The New Muslim Guide. Inshallah, I'm going to post a link to the PDF. In the comment box here on Zoom and also inshallah on the Facebook. Inshallah, if we have no questions, Jazakallah Khair. Thank you guys so much for your time. We'll see each other next week. Tuesday, next week, we'll be in the Masjid Ibn Sina, Islamic Center in Queens. And please don't forget to join us for our morning readings of the Quran and the Tafsir. We go through Tafsir al Sadi. And we read through the Quran. The Tafsir class is at 7 a.m. 
and it lasts until 7.30 and the Quran reading is from 7.30 to 8 on the same Zoom link and Alhamdulillah, Inshallah, I hope to see you guys there uh, Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik, Ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk Subhanak Rabbika Rabbi Aizati Amma Yasifun wa salamun ala al-Mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen